Welcome everybody. We'll give everyone just a minute to join us before we begin. Welcome, everybody. I know some people are still joining us, but I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I'm Jennifer Manukin, and I have the good luck to be Dean here at UCLA School of Law, and I want to thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, we're going to begin with just a couple of acknowledgments. Um, first of all, as a land-grant institution, the UCLA School of Law wants to acknowledge, and I want to acknowledge, the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caregivers and caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin. I also want to note that today is, is September 11th, and 19 years ago uh, was, of course, 9-11. Um, and um, that was a, a, a tragic and extraordinarily difficult moment in our um, nation's uh, story. And I want us to just take a minute to acknowledge uh, that this is the anniversary of 9-11 and to just have a moment um, of reflection and in honor of those who, who lost their lives that day. Thank you. I, uh, I especially wanted to um, make a point of noting that because uh, today we have um, we we have somebody from New York, which was of course the epicenter of of, of the tragedy that day, here with us. Um, and I'm just delighted to bring you the fifth installment in our From the Frontline virtual summer series. Uh, as we all know, these are extraordinary times in our nation in so many ways. And I'm really pleased that UCLA Law School can um, bring together these opportunities for conversations, uh, whether it's with other faculty, alums, um, friends, or other distinguished figures, experts in legal, political, and social arena to help us understand and dissect some of the issues that our nation is grappling with in the current moment. Today, it's my great pleasure to have the chance to speak with Cyrus Vance Jr., the District Attorney from the County of New York. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, uh, uh, District Attorney Vance. It's really, it's really such a pleasure. Um, District Attorney Vance is a graduate of the Yale uh, of Yale and Georgetown University Law Center, and he worked early in his career as an assistant DA in New York, and then he came to our coast, to the West Coast, um, although a little bit north of here, uh, uh, Washington State, to pursue um, uh, work in criminal defense, um, and then eventually returned to New York, and in 2010 became New York's District Attorney. Under DA Vance's tenure, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has overseen a great number of cases that have gained both national and international attention, and his office has become a leader in criminal justice issues. During his time in DA, as DA, some of his achievements have included 24 indictments against gun traffickers, the dismantling of several domestic and international cybercrime and identity theft operations, and the recovery of nearly $12 billion over the course of settlements uh, with nine banks um, that, that we'll be talking about later. Um, his office has also grappled with the significant challenges around issues ranging from COVID-19 to police brutality to systemic racism, to uh, our president's tax returns. And uh, we'll certainly have plenty to talk about. Um, so first of all, um, thank you, uh, District Attorney Vance, for being with us today. It's really a pleasure, and I very much appreciate it. Dean, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, thank you for including me in your series. Uh, well, it's 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 our pleasure. Um, uh, those of you who are listening in, if you'd like to, uh, we will. I will take some time um, to take up some of your questions. Um, so, if you use the Q and A function to write a question, um, I will certainly try to get to to a number of them later in our time together. Um, Let's start with uh, your, just your time in office. You became um, DA uh, in 2010. Uh, and I'd love to just get an overview of, of how, how your role and some of what's changed over that time and some of um, the ways that the public expectations of your office, um, both, both your responsibilities and the opportunities have changed over that decade. Well, Dean, as you said, I, I 
came into office in 2010, and I succeeded uh, uh, my successor, my predecessor, Bob Morgenthau, who had held the job for 34 years. And so I came at a time of change, uh, not in that office, but I think reflective of the justice system uh, overall. And 10 years or 11 years later, uh, the office has changed a great deal, and certainly times have continued to change enormously. Uh, when I came into the office, uh, I think I saw a, a number of the issues that we needed to prepare ourselves for as a major metropolitan office. Uh, among the most important was to become competent in investigating and prosecuting cybercrime, uh, something that really was uh, an absolute necessity, but not yet uh, fully incorporated in the work of the office. Uh, and we've built a 75 person unit with a cyber lab. And now I think we, we are capable of handling the most complex crimes that do come into to our county. Uh, the main job of a DA has been, and I think will continue to be, balancing public safety and fairness. And those were the really two pillars that I always keep my eye on in, in, in managing this office. Uh, but I think the role of the district attorney's office and a DA has changed somewhat in the past 10 years, and I think for the better. Uh, despite, besides the focus on serious violent crime, gangs, guns, robberies, sexual assaults, which are uh, the traditional work of district attorney, as well as maintaining a, an excellence in, in the legal work in the courtroom, uh, I think the role of district attorney has, uh, has changed in that uh, I, and I think others, define crime fighting differently than I did when I came in in 2010. And by that, I mean, uh, I think we can all agree that a crime prevented is far better than a crime prosecuted, both for, for all the parties involved. Right. And so I think, I think crime prevention strategies weren't really viewed as crime fighting strategies in 2010. Uh, but it's my belief that if you can, uh, through policy and enforcement, uh, reduce crime outside of your traditional role, that's, that's a win uh, for, for all the reasons that are self-evident. And in my time as district attorney, uh, for example, uh, we set about early on to uh, rethink what kinds of cases we were going to bring into the DA's office. Uh, among them, uh, for the obvious consideration, were low-level misdemeanor and other violation offenses, which really had come in by the tens of thousands every year. In 29, we had 110,000 cases processed by our office. In 2019, we had roughly 50,000 cases processed by our office. And that delta was the product of deciding we were going to divert or otherwise address low-level criminal offenses, some of which you might call quality of life offenses, over that nine or 10-year time period. That's important in and of itself. Those offenses are disproportionately affecting men and women of color. Uh, the courts are really incapable of taking those relatively minor cases and actually addressing the consequence of the, the, the reasons behind the activity that led someone to get arrested. And so I felt we could get better outcomes, uh, certainly no worse outcomes, were we to focus on uh, diversion or other kinds of ways to, uh, to, to address those, uh, address those patterns. Um, and so the second part, though, uh, which is also important, is that notwithstanding the broken windows discussion. During that same time period, we reduced uh, violent crimes significantly uh, in Manhattan, both shootings and homicides uh, and, and robberies and the like. So I think, uh, Dean, my point is that the role I saw it as a crime fighter uh, entailed investments in crime prevention strategies in different ways of managing cases, and it led to and reduction in crime, uh, which I think uh, is the best of both worlds. You don't use one ounce more of criminal justice authority than you need to, uh, to obtain the greatest degree of public safety that you can. That's a really significant reduction. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's at least a 50% reduction over this period. Um, was, that, um, was that part of the strategy from the, I mean, did you think you could bring um, the numbers down that much when you started? Was that a goal or was that, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. I think in one sense, it actually started with the issue of, of, of race in criminal justice and, and evaluating our office in terms of any potential bias that is revealed in the work that we did. So one of the first things that I did when I was district attorney was to bring in the Vera Institute of Justice, which is an international group well-known in the field. 
uh, to come into our office and conduct a racial bias analysis, to statistically look at records, uh, to look for um, statistical outcomes involving plea bargaining, uh, bail recommendations, sentencing recommendations, and charging and the like. And after three years, Vera came up with a report which showed that we had issues that we needed to deal with in the Manhattan DA's office. It was not a bad report, but I was much more interested in finding out if there was a problem rather than ducking whether or not we had one. But that focus on race in the criminal justice system really also brought home to me the fact that our justice system uh, handles cases which disproportionately impact men and women of color. I'd say 85 to 90% of the cases uh, that come into our system involve men and women of color. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of those are in low-level offenses. And so our, my goal to reduce the prosecution of low-level offenses without sacrificing public safety was both to achieve better public safety outcomes, but also a fairer, I believe, and a justice system perceived to be fairer, uh, uh, focusing on alternatives to, uh, to prosecution, which, uh, which during the time period of 2010 to 2019 achieved significant reductions in violent crime. Then came 2020, and uh, and I, I think we'll, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it later. But there, there's a lot of factors that have affected um, crime in 2020, uh, which I think make the year aberrant, but nonetheless a real challenge for us. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to. I, I would like to get to 2020, but maybe let's 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 pause and get to that in a few minutes, um, and to talk about about the pandemic and so much else that's going on now. Um, I'd love to ask you first, though, something our audience members may not know much about. Some of them, I think, probably know a lot about this, but others others not so. Um, is that your your office has had the chance to make really substantial investments in um, in projects that uh, help make. Um, the, the city stronger and help invest in injustice. Then you've been able to use money seized in your prosecutions um, against big banks and um, choose how to invest that. Could you tell us a little bit more about that whole um, process? Um, sure. Um, I'm sure it's familiar with the audience that there are forfeiture laws that uh, apply in states, various states, as well as in the federal government. And uh, we, over the course of 10 years, investigated and in some instances prosecuted or, or, or resolved investigations with 10 to 11 foreign banks. These are major international financial institutions who were stripping, identifying uh, factors and, and, and information from uh, wire transfers into the New York banking system in order to hide the fact that these funds were coming from countries like Sudan, Libya, or Iran, or from individuals who were associated with terrorist activity. Uh, and uh, our office began those investigations uh, in 29 and, and completed its first in 2010. And over the course of the next 10 years, roughly $14 billion were recovered from those investigations. Now, half that money went to the federal government uh, for its general fund, because in many instances, we were working hand in glove with the US Attorney's Office in DC or New York or, or, or in the Southern District. But the other half of the money came back to the state of New York. And half, about roughly half of those funds went to the state and roughly half went to the city. So that enabled the city and the state to invest billions of dollars into uh, whatever they felt were their priorities. But about $800 million uh, came to us as a result of the formula related to some of these forfeiture uh, programs. It was a responsibility to steward that money and it was a privilege. Uh, but, and using that money, we were able to provide literally hundreds of millions of dollars to our city agency partners like NYCHA, our, our public housing developments, who, who have 26% of violent crime in the developments, but only 6% of the population. This is a, you know, a city park that needed funding and help, which we could provide. Or even to the NYPD, uh, we funded the, uh, their ability to completely transform their, their mobile technology uh, for, for the police department, which enables the police to be smarter and safer when they're out uh, out in the streets. Mm -hmm. But we determined that we would take about $250 million and we would invest it. Uh, these are, you know, criminal assets. We would invest criminal assets into the communities. And we would do it into the communities really at the grassroots level. Wow. Because what we were seeing was that, of course, there are many major philanthropies uh, that do great work in New York and elsewhere. But that in the various neighborhards of New York, especially the dis economically disadvantaged ones, 
there are phenomenal not-for-profits which struggle for funding. Uh, they often don't have the sophistication to apply for you know, major grants. And so we really had a process where we, we, we brought uh, uh, around the table experts in the field. We then defined uh, what areas we were going to look to fund, which included uh, crime prevention and, and support for kids who may be criminally justice involved or families, uh, special victims, uh, uh, helping special victims and, and survivors, and then uh, those returning from prison, citizens coming back home uh, to, uh, to New York City. And all in all, Dean, we've funded 50 different grantees uh, over the course of these last three years, and the results of those investments and funding will be the product of uh, technical analyses uh, starting probably at the end of this year. And, uh, but the whole point of it was uh, by supporting New York's communities uh, with money, which happened to be the results of criminal proceeds, uh, we are, I think, making a difference in making these neighborhoods uh, safer and uh, making the communities more whole. And that, I think, is an is, is a unexpected but phenomenal uh, byproduct of, of our work in the office. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of uh, astonishing. And it's not really something that we associate with, with prosecutors' offices, right? I mean, that is, even if we understand forfeiture laws and, um, and th the idea of being able to invest that quantity of money and making choices about how to invest, um, how did you in your office kind of develop, uh, I mean, th that's the kind of thing that foundations do and, and philanthropists, how did you develop um, an expertise and an approach to it? Can you tell us a little more about that? It's really interesting. Sure. Well, number one, we, need, we, we knew we needed help. We are subject matter experts on crime, but right. we are not necessarily subject matter experts on crime prevention uh, and, and what organizations, in what communities, in what areas, uh, uh, subject areas as well as geographic, uh, were those that the communities wanted most help in. And ultimately what we did, uh, Dean, was that we uh, brought in the Institute for State and Local Government, which is the City University of New York. It's sort of government's a, a good government think tank out of the mm -hmm. uh, out of CUNY. And they became our thought partners and sort of our technical ex experts who helped us envision uh, what we should be funding by talking to hundreds of, uh, of, of stakeholders in, in New York City and in the neighborhoods around New York. That then focused our, our efforts into those three categories that I talked about, you know, uh, criminally justice involved kids right. and folks uh, who, who, who have uh, needs uh, in those areas, uh, survivors and returning citizens from jail. And every grant uh, is the product, issued is the product of an RFP, a request for proposal. Right. So these are publicly, um, publicly set out for, for, uh, uh, for entities to you know, to submit grant funding, and it's a competitive process. The I did not make any decisions myself on 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 what grants were given, but there's a committee with outside mm -hmm. participants and and a couple from our office as well who score these grant proposals, just like a foundation does. Mm -hmm. So we ended up being a foundation, uh, right. a quasi a quasi foundation. But what we did right, I think, is to recognize where we didn't have the expertise and made sure that we could justify the expenditure of the funds on these projects uh, if, if, if called upon to do so. And, and I, I think we're very proud of our uh, selection of all the grantees who are doing amazing work. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for so, sharing so, that. So for example, just one example, uh, the, the Exodus Foundation is in East Harlem, and it's been focused on, uh, on, on helping citizens returning from jail for 20 years. We just gave them an $8 million grant for them to develop a trauma center. I think we all know now that, uh, unfortunately, hurt people hurt people. And folks who are traumatized, whether it is in the family or uh, by being a victim of crime, uh, need help, but often don't know where to get it and don't know where to get it uh, given competently and uh, in a setting where, which is embracing. And so Exodus uh, will now be able to provide clinical support in a number of areas around trauma, you know, around trauma relief and help, as well as non-traditional areas, and they'll be able to do it in East Harlem. That's great. And I think around the country, folks understand the increasing need to focus on preventing crime and restoring, you know, re restoring individuals who have experienced trauma around crime, 
uh, as being a key thing that the criminal justice system needs to adjust, uh, to accept. So I think this will be a laboratory uh, uh, for perhaps uh, others, others to look at down the road. Wow, that's fascinating. That's great. Um, really, I, and I hope, I hope it works. I hope that, that, that um, thank you for sharing that. I'd love to ask you, um, over, your de over the decade, um, I'd love to have you tell us about both a case that you're exceptionally proud of um, and that you'd like to share with us, and then also maybe a case where, in retrospect, you think you made the wrong call or you wish you'd handled differently. I'd love to hear about one of each. Sure. Well, one of the cases that I, you know, I'm, I first I got to say our, you know, our office is an excellent office uh, in, in a country with excellent offices, but I do think that our office has not shied away from some of the most difficult cases and some of the most complex. And one during my time that I was uh, very, very involved and invested in was the investigation to determine after 30 years, could we find the individual who was responsible for the murder of Aton Pates? in 1979. Now, for those on, uh, on the seminar, Aton Pates was six years old when he is going to his first day at school, uh, lived in Soho in downtown New York. His mother, Julie, said goodbye and let him walk to school, uh, walk to get the bus, which is about a block and a half away, and uh, he was never seen again. Uh, he never got to school. And for the next 35 years, um, the, the Pates family didn't know what happened to Aton. And of course, they were devastated, as you can only imagine, and it affected their lives and their families' lives enormously, and, and in some cases, tragically. When I was running for district attorney in 2009, I met with the Pates family, uh, and they asked me, uh, would I reopen the investigation into uh, who had killed their son? Mm -hmm. They had firm beliefs about who they thought had done it, uh, and so I think they were coming in with a sense of, well, this is where you're going to end up, Mr. Vance. And I told them, you have to understand when we start this, I don't know where we're going to end up. And it may not be where you think we're going to end up, but I promise you that our office will do everything it can uh, to look at afresh at the issue of who killed Aton. And you may remember at the time, I think Aton was the first, first picture of a child on a milk carton, uh, which then became ubiquitous. And that's how folks were under, perhaps identifying missing children. Well. The case was investigated for about a year and a half, and there's twists and turns, which I you know, won't, won't get into, but it was quite complicated. But ultimately, uh, from a, you know, ultimately, we were able to identify uh, through reports of a family member of the ultimate defendant who we believe killed Aton Pates, Pedro Hernandez. And uh, so 35 years literally to the day after Aton Pates disappeared, uh, Mr. Mr. Hernandez was arrested. Um, incredibly circumstantial case, very difficult. If you could imagine trying a case in 2017 or 18 where there was no digital evidence of any kind mm -hmm. introduced because yeah. the evidence all came from 1979, uh, including trying to go back and reimagine what the streets looked like in order wow. to match up witness testimony. So it was a very complicated case. Uh, the first trial took uh, uh, three months and was hung 11 to one for conviction. So we had to try it again. Uh, the second trial a year and a half later took probably about the same. And the jury was also out for a long time. Uh, but ultimately, and, I, and I, they were very comfortable that they had, uh, when we had found the man uh, who had uh, murdered and killed Aton, murdered and, and taken Aton Bates. And it was a case where it was not the person that the family was convinced had done it initially. Uh, wow. the, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of book writing and guessing and information that pointed people in one direction, but ultimately it was quite clear to me and us that was not the person. This other person was the person, uh, but the family really had to sit through the whole trial and see the evidence every day until at the end, you know, Mr. Pates, Stan Pates was, I, I, I see, you know, I, I totally understand what's happened. And it, you know, they were just lovely people. Um, and uh, it was real, it was a privilege. Uh, it was a privilege and very hard work, but something that I think every prosecutor wants our office wants to let people know they can do is that victims are not going to be forgotten and that no matter how long ago it happened no matter how hard it may be uh, we will do everything we can to provide closure uh, for victims and these these cold and old cases are are, are, are among the toughest I would say uh, one of the areas that uh, that 
where I think it shows sort of the what's at stake in the work that we do is we uh, we've taken gun violence very very seriously in our office as I think most prosecutors do uh, and yet uh, there are those instances where you're called upon to assess how do you resolve a gun case should it be with confinement should it be without confinement and you know these are I think everyone who's watching understands this is a dynamic that is so difficult to figure out. There's no magic, there's no magic formula for determining what you're going to decide as a prosecutor, how that's going to impact the individual. In one case, a young man uh, involved in gang, gang activity um, uh, was arrested, indicted for gun possession. And uh, he joined a, you know, a, a program with a local foundation uh, a service provider in New York City and was doing quite well. Um, and then I had to make the decision, okay, well, what do we do with his case? Do we, you know, do we do what we've done traditionally and say he pleads guilty and goes to state prison or do we do something different and provide an alternative? And I made the decision that we should provide a non-incarceratory alternative. Uh, and that, and uh, the reason I did was because um, he was doing very well, uh, and I did not feel it made sense to ask him or his family have him go back into prison. Uh, he pleaded guilty. Uh, if he failed to uh, live up to the terms, then he would be subject to a sentence. Uh, but within about a couple of months, he went out, uh, got involved in gang activity, and shot somebody. Um, and so that's an instance where I don't know, you know, there, there, there is no crystal ball that comes with the job. And you are going to make decisions um, that uh, are going to have real life consequences. And you can only make the best decision you can and go through a process that lets you know, I've, I've looked at it as much as I can, I've weighed all sides, then you have to make a call. And sometimes that call you make is not going to turn out the way you hoped. And in this instance, it did not. But I think as district attorney, um, and probably for all lawyers or people, is that all you, and my belief is all you can really do in life is to say you've done your best to understand all the angles and issues in order to make an informed judgment. And then you have to make a judgment and you pray that you got it right. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I'm curious about other areas where, where social ideas and cultural norms also shift over time. Um, and I think about, for example, the rise of, of the Me Too movement over the period that you've been in office. Um, I know that back in 2015, your office declined to charge uh, Harvey Weinstein, um, but then later brought felony sex charges against him, and that trial concluded last February. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what changed um, both in that case and also maybe a little bit more generally in your office for thinking about um, sexual assault crimes? Um, I think, I think a, lot, a lot changed uh, around the country, the whole country. I think Me Too, uh, the Me Too movement was uh, a very powerful, to state the obvious, uh, very powerful uh, movement that affected not just my office as, as prosecutor, but I think prosecutor's office around the country. In 2015, uh, a complaint was made against Harvey Weinstein. It was a misdemeanor complaint. And, um, uh, and what I did uh, in order to sort of satisfy the rules I just laid out is I asked the chief of our sex crimes unit to investigate. Uh, at the time, she was a 39-year veteran, uh, incredibly talented trial attorney and, and un unaffected by politics or anything else. And at the time, also the chairwoman of the Department of Defense uh, Commission on Sexual Assault in the Military. So she brought a lot of experience to bear. Uh, she conducted the investigation. Uh, there was a lot of information collected, a, a good part of it, non-public information, which affected the judgment. And ultimately her recommendation, and I'm not a sex crimes expert, was that the case should not be brought. And, uh, and we made the decision not to bring it. Uh, several years later, um, after uh, Mr. Weinstein was identified in other uh, serious felony allegations, um, uh, we recommenced an investigation of Mr. Weinstein, uh, and it took roughly about, probably about a year and a half. Uh, ultimately, he was indicted uh, for very serious sexual assaults, ultimately uh, convicted last February, as you say, and is now serving 23-year prison term in New York State Prison. And um, uh, many things, I think, changed as a result of 
of the Me Too movement um, that affected me and affected my office. Uh, I, as, a, you know, as a matter of how we deal with uh, survivors of sexual assault, um, I believed that we, you know, I think every office sort of has a, has a way they've done cases over time and, and, and a tradition in a bureau, whether it's cybercrime, homicides. But I, I believe that uh, there were understandings coming all around the country, probably around the world, about the best ways to interview survivors of sexual assault in order to get at the truth. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and, and to make the, the survivors feel um, that they are being listened to and supported. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, not just of Me Too, but of sort of the growth uh, of, of awareness in the field, uh, we've had our entire office now undergo FETI training. I can't tell you what the acronym means, but it's essentially it's everybody is, is open now to and, and exp more experienced in the different ways of approaching interviews or interrogations. That, that are believed to actually enhance the likelihood of getting uh, the truth with uh, a, a, perhaps a softer touch uh, on, on the individual. Now, that's not to say there are not tough interrogations, because that, you know, that that, that's going to happen. But an office shift in terms of understanding perhaps a different way to do things and, and, and to train. Within the unit itself, uh, we have uh, sought outside guidance uh, on how we can, uh, again, better uh, you know, Make the process by which we evaluate cases and and, and evaluate the you know the data on on our cases more uh, more accurately. So I think the the office did change and and I and I will say that um, uh, I, I do think that the 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 really incredibly heroic survivors, women who testified at that trial and and withstood. Uh, very hard, aggressive, uh, and personal questioning, and, and really had their whole lives laid out uh, in all in all their detail to to the to the jurors. Um, you know, I absolutely believed these women when I talked when when I spoke with them and met them, uh, which is why we ultimately brought the case. Uh, but I think it also showed us as an office we've been doing tough cases for a long time. That's not really not the issue, but that it it showed that. Um, uh, women who, uh, people who have uh, experiences of victims of crime um, uh, with experiences maybe others haven't had um, will be believed uh, and, 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 and could and should be brought forward if they choose to, to come and, and present cases. So I think it is, I think it affirmed in my mind uh, that, uh, that it, Witnesses and survivors who come and tell the truth, and who are and who are, are prepared to go through the, all that goes, all that entails being a, a, a witness in a, in a high visibility trial. Trial uh, that ultimately uh, they were absolutely heroic, uh, and they did. Uh, I, I think they were proud uh, as well of what they showed to themselves that they could put up with, and I think a just outcome was achieved. And I do believe that. Uh, holding someone like Mr. Weinstein with his enormous power, uh, which he had exercised for so long, and silencing uh, so, for many for so long, uh, was an indication that, uh, that, that these kinds of complicated cases could and should be brought to juries. Thank you. That's interesting. I mean, it suggests a sort of cultural shift um, about what, what both the public and your office might view as a, as a potentially winnable case. Um, but you also tell a story of, of, of victims having to go through a fair amount um, to get there, right? And, so. and, yeah, many, and there are many individuals <clears throat> uh, with whom we spoke who, who did not want to participate. Um, and we you know, respected their, their wishes. Uh, and, but I, I think it will give, I think it will give um, courage, I hope, to other assault survivors um, having seen the Weinstein case which was so difficult to come to uh, a, a, a you know, positive conclusion. <clears throat> I'm curious if there's other places where, over your, over, where you've seen a kind of uh, either cultural shift or, or process shift in sort of how we think about uh, a core issue. Um, like I'm wondering about, for example, bail. Um, have you seen a shift in your own thinking over your time in office? Um, I, and if so, can you tell us about that? Number one, uh, elected DAs evolve. 
Um, right. and, and I think you, you hope they do. Uh, and, and certainly when I came into the office, I didn't have in mind that I was going to try to reduce the volume of low level offenses that we prosecuted by 60,000. Um, but over time, uh, you both see more, learn more, understand more, and I think also develop confidence that you can achieve more. Um, in the area of bail, uh, I think uh, our office probably had a fundamental, sh its most fundamental shift about three or four years ago. Uh, and, and there will be, I'm sure, public defenders who said it wasn't soon enough uh, and who, who, who felt our practices were, were too strict. Um, but but we, uh, we concluded that we did need fundamental revising uh, of what our practices should be around requesting bail for a misdemeanor case, for example, or a nonviolent felony case versus you know, a violent felony. And depending upon the, the background and circumstances of the individual. So we did have, a, I think, a fundamental shift in bail policy about three or four years ago. It's also, uh, it's also come about in ways that I could not have predicted when uh, COVID-19 hit New York City in mid-March of, of, of this year. Um, we were confronted relatively quick, quickly with um, the fact that COVID-19 was in Rikers Island, our city prison. And uh, I think appropriately, uh, the mayor uh, and, uh, and the district attorneys uh, sat down and uh, worked together on identifying those folks who were in Rikers Island who we believed uh, under the circumstance, crisis circumstances that we were facing uh, should be released. In some cases uh, with supervised release, in some cases with electronic monitoring. But uh, our office reduced its population of men and women in Rikers Island by 45% in about a two month time period. And the population of Rikers Island went from over 6,000 to under 4,000 the lowest level that it had been since, I think, I think World War II. So, there, so um, at the end of the day, uh, that, you know, that, for, that forced, and I, and I think in a good way, us to say, well, what's the criteria uh, in this extraordinary time that we're going to use? It may not be in the statute books. I mean, the statute says one thing, but we need to go perhaps further, which we did. Uh, and, and so in that sense, that changed uh, our bail uh, philosophy, and I think it will change it uh, prospectively as well. I think uh, the idea of being able to uh, understand for every individual who's in Rikers Island why the office has made that request uh, and, and, you know, and can justify it, I think is, is a good thing. If you had your druthers, would you still have a system of money, of cash bail? What do you I think about it as a... I wouldn't. I, I, uh, for quite some time, I, you know, I've come to the view that we ought to get money out of bail uh, entirely and that we ought to adopt systems that are used in, I think, 49 out of the 50 states uh, and the federal government, which is money is really not the factor. But it really should be whether a judge determines that the individual uh, before him or her, uh, if released, uh, it will present a danger during that time period. Or, or a serious risk of flight. And it should be, as I think it is in states like New Jersey, it should be a process that is uh, highly procedural, that you know, the judge should have measures to, in order to make up her or his mind as to whether this should be done and there should be, uh, there should be frequent reviews uh, to make sure that uh, a remand is still appropriate. Again, that's, now that's not, a, that's not a policy that I think uh, a number of defense lawyers in New York City agree with. Um, but I, I ultimately think it is a, um, uh, it is more fair um, in the long run, and I think will result in in less individuals uh, detained pretrial. Thanks. Um, I want to. I, I, I'm going to turn pretty soon to some of the the numerous questions that we're we're getting. We're getting some excellent questions um, from the audience. But I do want to um, talk about uh, your role as DA um, since the last presidential election. I'm I'm certainly mindful you can't um, really speak about your office's ongoing work uh, regarding um, President Trump or his organizations. But can you can you tell us a little bit about um, how it is or why it is that you are engaged in that kind of investigation or or sure. anything about how your mandates changed over the last few years? Well, I, I, I don't think our mandates have changed really at all. Uh, I just think that the Trump uh, issue appeared, uh, became, became relevant, and 
uh, and, and actually relevant when the president's lawyers attached the grand jury subpoena to a civil complaint, which it filed in federal court. So that 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 is how the the the, um, the grand jury issue uh, became uh, became known. But our office has always done uh, economic and business crime, and it's always done economic and business crime uh, that very often involved conduct or misconduct outside of Manhattan. And the reason it can do that and should do that is that if a crime, uh, an element of the crime is committed in Manhattan or the impact of the crime uh, visits itself on Manhattan, those, fa those factors provide jurisdiction for our office. It's enabled us, for example, to prosecute or investigate those 11 to 12 uh, right. foreign banks successfully. And, and as a result of that sort of broad jurisdiction to be able to to support so many, uh, so many good things in state and in, in federal government, and that, and we have a you know a, a hundred lawyer investigation units, and so this is work we've always done. Um, and you know the Trump Organization, situated in Manhattan as its as its headquarters, uh, it, that that you know, it, it is it's it's not unusual for us to investigate a business in Manhattan. Okay. Um, is there anything else you can tell us about, say, I mean, why we even know about this at this stage now? I mean, the, is there... the reason you know about it is because, and what I think is sort of an unusual move, is that it's the uh, the president's lawyers who themselves publicize the existence of a grand jury subpoena, which is ordinarily because otherwise, that, right? That's not public information, right? So. Um, and so that's how it, um, you know, that's how it became public, and we have taken that. That, that lawsuit with regard to the Article II presidential uh, powers went all the way up to the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, so we prevailed on, on that issue. Uh, and, and then it was sent back to the lower court to, uh, to review issues around, the, around sort of more standard issues around uh, subpoena objections, overbreadth, vagueness, and the like, which is where we are. Great. I would love to turn to kind of uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, 2020, um, the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, um, and to get a sense of how this um, incredible uh, constellation of events is affecting your city, your office, uh, your prosecutorial decisions. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, I think it's had a, I think it has had a, it's had a huge impact. Um, uh, and. It, it, and I think that the aftermath of, of, uh, of Mr. Floyd's death um, had a particularly powerful impact, uh, obviously across the country, uh, in the city, and also in our office. I mean, I think the lawyers and, and professional staff in our office were uh, were personally and deeply affected, uh, and uh, and were blunt and direct in expressing their concerns about the justice system to me directly uh, through meetings with affinity groups that I was having over, at, with over, at, over Zoom at the time because we weren't able to be physically in the same space. And, uh, it, uh, and those were very impactful to me. Uh, and it has, you know, I think it was important for us to um, uh, consider how, what we can do better in our office in, in terms of our policies, uh, our prosecution policies that may, that may relate to, uh, to race or bias and, and, to, and to think anew. And it's also uh, enabled us to think differently about uh, how diverse groups within our office get information to me and are able to you know, communicate their views on policy to me directly. And one thing that we did was to establish what we call an equity and social justice advisory panel. Uh, which is made up of 16 individuals in the office, both professional staff and, and assistant district attorneys, who meet, um, thanks, who meet uh, uh, to consider uh, what proposals they want to develop around what issues and then present them to me as a policy proposal they want to have considered. And so in the upcoming months, I know I'm going to be receiving a number of proposals that they've, uh, that they've prepared and worked hard on. But the goal was really to give uh, the, the office in its diversity uh, the feeling that it had more of a hand on the steering wheel of the institution and the opportunity to, to meet with me more directly and to have a back and forth conversation, which at the end of the day is hugely valuable to me or any DA. Um, and I, and I, think it is, uh, I think it is positive uh, for the participants, but I ultimately think the beneficiary 
are the folks uh, uh, who run the office. And another thing that we instituted this year was a 360 degree um, evaluation system so that it's no longer just supervisors evaluating the young assistants in the bureaus, it's the young assistants in the bureaus evaluating. Getting people, to go in. Which again, I think is, is only going to, and, 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 I'm sure it, uh, it has lots of complications, but I think it's only for the better uh, when we are having the office more generally feeling empowered. Thanks. I'm curious how your office has thought about, um, I mean, so I, my understanding is you, you're not, you didn't prosecute uh, protesters who violated curfew. Um, how are you thinking about those who are involved in, um, you know, looting or other kinds of actions during the, the, uh, the protests? Um, it's, These are hard questions. Well, it was it was a very difficult time for the city, and it was a difficult time for the people who were out uh, marching and protesting. There were there was obviously great pain and and anxiety and anger, uh, all of which is completely understandable. Uh, and there, it was a difficult time uh, for law enforcement uh, to try to address this uh, in, in a competent way. But the decision that we made was that. Uh, Although there are, there is a law. Um, it's a B misdemeanor and it's unlawful uh, assembly. Uh, a, a law that I think is of dubious constitutionality, uh, which has never been tested, uh, but but resulted in the arrest of uh, you know of, of a, a number of a lot of folks. And we made the decision that uh, you know that we would not pro we would not prosecute that because I felt the harm in doing that was actually was was going to be significant. Uh, um, for all the ways that an arrest is significant on a person's life, and I think was um, it was important that uh, the office be seen as something that it was going to stand for promoting peaceful um, assembly. Uh, now, that contrast that to individuals who were arrested for breaking into uh, stores, whether breaking windows or looting in stores, and in some cases possession of stolen property. Uh, those cases were charged, and there are about six hundred cases uh, that are under review by our office for burglary um, in, in its in various uh, various states which which we need to be thoughtfully uh, thoughtfully evolved so I do I do make a distinction uh, as I think one must between uh, assembly even if loud and raucous but nonetheless peaceful and for a good motive uh, and cause versus uh, breaking and entering stores which I think uh, does affect sort of the the security uh, of the city and and the people's sense of us uh, of safety. Thank you. I there's lots more I could ask you, but I also there's a there's a large number of questions coming from the audience, and so I'd like to take up um, some of those. Um, and uh, I'm going to pick a few. There's many I'm not going to be able to get to, um, but but um, let's start with this. Um, uh, somebody's wondering about um, about about police unions and policing and whether they're should be some mechanisms like uh, an independent local or state agency um, to help investigate um, and potentially prosecute law enforcement offices, um, and more generally, how to think about the power of police unions and what can your office do to make police records of discipline public or the discipline or discharge of law enforcement op officers who warrant it uh, easier. Um, Love to hear well, your thoughts. We've done a couple of things, and then I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the first part of the question. But we have our, our office for really the last three to four years has been uh, vocal in uh, in supporting the change in the laws about confidentiality of police personnel files, and uh, it, it arose initially with uh, uh, disagreements between the police departments, uh, general counsel, and our office about when we would get those records uh, in the life of the case. What what I, one thing that we haven't talked about is conviction integrity. But right. we opened the, a unit the day I got in in 2010, and and and, and I think we we understood very. And I was been a defense lawyer for 20 years before that. Um, that it's not enough to get information that may undermine the credibility of the police officer. Uh, as the investigative process, you get that at the tail end of an investigation. You need that at the front end because information in there may well affect um, your decision about whether to bring charges or against whom. Ultimately, that was decided by the legislature earlier this spring, and now that the laws have passed where those kinds of records, with some, rare, with some exceptions, appropriate exceptions, are now going to be made public. 
Uh, so to the questioner, that really, I think, has been addressed in, in, in large part in Europe. The role of police unions, um, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, I, you know, I believe in unions, uh, and, and I, I believe in the power that they bring to, uh, you know, to their members who individually um, may, may lack the power of bargaining and otherwise. To, to, but um, uh, the, 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 the impact of unions, uh, it, it, I, I don't think you can disband unions, and I don't think you can disband police unions. I, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have not accepted police uh, contributions from unions in this election cycle. Um, I think that's probably a good thing for DAs going forward to just simply get that issue off the table. I did accept them in a prior election, but I, you know, I think that upon reflection, that's, that's smart not to do. Um, and I, but I would say to the questioner, we, we, we charged many police officers, I mean, and, and I don't say that proudly, but from everything from, from perjury to uh, sexual assault to, you know, to sale of drugs to lying about stop and frisks or lying about the circumstances where they were using a search warrant. And I think it's not, it's not, uh, it's not at all unusual if called for that we will prosecute a police officer. I also understand that the, the idea, the public wants the feeling that there is independence. And, and I, in our state, the attorney general now investigates uh, police involved fatal fatalities where uh, there was the, the individual who was killed was not armed. And that, you know, and, and that I think seems to be working well. Thanks. I think that was the, the sort of the impetus of the first part of the question was whether, whether prosecutors offices, given their, their necessary and intensive engagements with the police are really in a position to be able to um, charge and pursue those cases or whether we might need something I, a little more independent. I, I, I understand the suspicion. Uh, by some that 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 think there is an inherent conflict, uh, and I respect that. I mean, uh, but but I do think that by and large, it's worked quite it's worked fairly and well. Uh, great. Well, thank you. Um, another question from an audience member is about the sort of uh, the role of deterrence and how much you think deterrence, um, how much the criminal justice system really plays a role in deterring crime. Um, and uh, that same questioner is curious about that in relationship to defining low level offenses and thinking about systemic consequences. Any thoughts? Well, I, I, I am unconvinced that, um, I'm not completely convinced that low-level offenses necessarily uh, that not that deciding not to prosecute or to find some alternative way to deal with low-level offenses means that violent crime will rise. So I, I, I think there was a 2017 or 16 report by our own Department of Investigation which which in its conclusion said there isn't a relation between uh, a, a, an increase in quality of life enforcement and a decrease in crime. In the last 10 years of our office uh, the statistics I gave at the front proved the same. Um, I will say this, I think deterrence can play a role. For example, in the gun areas that I talked about earlier, uh, our office, when I came in, in, immediately set about to try to focus on who was driving crime in Manhattan, violent crime, both with guns and, and gang crime. And, uh, and one tactic, which I think is appropriate, was that if you possessed a loaded gun in Manhattan, uh, there was going to be a significant consequence. And I think the, you know, the 10 years following 2010, when we started a crime strategies unit, which was focused on, on trying to understand who was driving crime in every neighborhood, uh, because of the way that we handled gun, uh, gun offenses, uh, gun crime and violent crime went down. And we know this because we also heard it on wiretaps and we heard it on jail calls uh, that you know, don't go to Manhattan because with a gun, because you know, if you're caught there, you will, you will go to jail. So I think there is a deterrent. And I think there's an example of what I would say is a good deterrent. Thank you. That's um, that's a you know a helpful example for thinking through what are you know complex questions and much debated in, in you know criminal law literatures as well. Um, I guess uh, I'm going to pick another audience question here, um, and this one's about uh, whether you have any thoughts about predictive policing, um, and also I think more generally um, the question about about biases in the system and whether tools and techniques that we use that might seem helpful may also create some real dangers of baking in uh, very worrying biases. Well, I do think that everyone brings bias to their daily life and, and that doesn't stop when you walk in your workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and one of the things that we did about eight years ago or seven years ago was sort of in the in the era when we did the Vera report was to bring in a, 
experts from Harvard to ultimately train the entire office on implicit bias, uh, which has which been a mandatory training. Uh, now, that should, you know, that's not enough. Uh, you know, it, having a lecture uh, come in a couple of times a year isn't going to solve the problem. That's right. Uh, and the Vera report was designed to sort of try to pinpoint you know, what practices have statistically significant differences that may indicate whether it's bias, or, uh, bias imp implicit or not, that where we need to focus. But I do think institutions uh, uh, th need, to, uh, need to have a way to transparently deal with this very important problem. And it's why I brought Vera in. Uh, and uh, it, it's it be simply because uh, I, for the public to have confidence in the institution, I think the institution has to be able to communicate how it's dealing with problems the public know exist. Thank you. Um, we, we probably have time for just a couple more questions. And there's one I want to ask. Um, we have some of our students listening today. And I, um, we also have a lot of students with a very serious interest in the criminal justice system and some of the, the problems with that system. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether, um, whether as a prosecutor, the ways in which you have an opportunity to engage at a system-wide level versus sort of focusing on individual cases and that relationship. And, you know, there's a growing progressive prosecutor movement. And um, I'd love to hear any thoughts in relationship to that as well. Well, I've been both uh, 20 years as a defense lawyer and, and, a, and a part of my uh, law practice and profession that I loved for all the reasons that defense lawyers love that work. We, we see huge responsibilities and uh, immediate accountability and it's very personal and it's very important. Um, I was a young prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office for six years, then obviously came back uh, in 2010. And I, you know, I see, again, uh, the power that young prosecutors have in impacting uh, not just the case that they're handling, but, as you say, more system-wide issues. Um, and you know, someone once told me, and I'm just repeating it, that you know, a busy prosecutor dismisses more cases in a month then a successful defense attorney dismiss, dismisses in a career. Um, that, that really there's, there, there are a lot of uh, thoughtful analyses going on by lawyers uh, where, where cases are not brought that are never made public and, and sometimes mistakes are made, which, which, which of course are, are tragic and need to be dealt with. But I, would, I think prosecution uh, is a phenomenally uh, important and uh, I think empowering in a good way uh, uh, legal profession. Uh, people who come to my office don't come there to exercise power. They usually come there because they want to make a difference. Uh, and, and most of them are, I would say, on the, you know, on the middle to left side of politics. And they view this as uh, doing something that's meaningful, that's helping their communities. Uh, uh, in many instances, they come because they want to you know, change the way uh, things have traditionally been done and, and want to challenge policies that impact race and social justice. And so uh, I, I think it's a great time to be a prosecutor. And, um, and I have always been very proud uh, of the lawyers in my office. And, and, and they're, you know, they're there because they want to do what they think is right. And I, and I think that's fantastic. Well, I think that's that's a good moment. There's lots more questions that I could ask and that the audience is asking as well, but uh, we're out of time and I think that's a good moment on which to end. I really wanna thank you for being with us um, and for spending um, this time with the UCLA School of Law community. And um, it's really been a pleasure to have the chance to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, it's been my pleasure. Mm -hmm.